The Anglo-Saxons weren't the only culture to engage in mass population movements in the wake of the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. Just as Germanic and Eastern tribes swept into the former imperial provinces in the 5th and 6th centuries to claim new lives and new territories for themselves, former imperial citizens and their subjects also moved about considerably. Both as a result of displacement because of the newcomers and because of their own expansionist goals. One of these groups of former Roman citizens on the move had originated in Britain, probably in the southwest of the province, in modern day Wales and Cornwall. The region that would soon become known as Dumnonia. Their destination had been the extreme northwesterly point of Gaul then known as Armorica. Today, we know it by a different name, one which was eventually adopted because of the origins of its inhabitants. We know it as Brittany. From Hadrian's Wall to the Black Sea, chaos reigned supreme in the 5th century AD, as Anglo-Saxon, Pictish and Irish invaders began to flood over the collapsed imperial borders into the former province of Britannia, large numbers of Romano-Britons seem to have migrated to mainland Europe in order to escape. Following in the footsteps of the legions withdrawn at the start of the century. Yet, they weren't the first to make this same journey. Archaeological and written evidence in fact suggests at least two distinct waves of migrations. One in the wake of imperial collapse in the 5th and 6th centuries, and the other more than a century earlier, in the late 300s. This earlier migration had perhaps been a result of romano britonic auxiliary soldiers being stationed in northwestern Gaul, opting to remain there to settle with their families, rather than return to Britain. Yet, rather than abandon the rest of the empire to its fate, somewhere between these two waves of migration, in the midst of the mysterious and chaotic 5th century, at least some of those romano britonic settlers seem to have engaged in the final stages of the fall of Rome. In the 6th century AD, the Gothic historian Jordanus wrote of a romano britonic leader who arrived in Gaul in around 470 with an impressive army of 12,000 men to aid the ailing Roman provincial leaders against the constant threat of the Visigoths, now ruling over vast swathes of formerly imperial territory in southern Gaul. His name was Riotimus, and Jordanus calls him King of the Britons. Though largely forgotten today, Riotimus speaks for a long lost age, a brief time before the total collapse of Britannia, when the Romano Britons ruled themselves and may have even looked to the continent to save the collapsing empire. A few fringe historians have even suggested Riotimus as a potential inspiration for the legendary figure of King Arthur. Though even if he did wield an army 12,000 strong, the odds were still substantially up against him. The Gaul that he and his men entered in the 470s was nothing like that of a hundred years before. For the most part, Germanic warrior elites and Roman generalissimos now held sway over an increasingly fragmenting Romano-Gallic population. Foremost amongst these newcomers, and a mainstay on the political scene for the last hundred years, were the Goths, a vast confederation of Germanic tribes ruling over a Romano-Gallic subject population. The Visigoths were then led by Euric, the son of Theodoric I, 
the king who had helped the great Roman general Flavius Aetius to defeat Attila the Hun on the Catalonian fields a generation earlier. Times had changed since the death of Attila and the collapse of the Hunnic Empire. Under Yorick, the Visigoths were just one of the powers who had arisen to fill the void. The 5th century was a time of warlords and chaos, when only the strongest survived. Archaeological evidence suggests a breakdown in society during this time, as imperial citizens and their subject peoples increasingly looked to local strongmen and fortified settlements to survive, rather than the grand imperial architecture and centralised control of ages past. It was into this chaotic mess that according to Jordanus, Riotimus and his warriors entered in 470, marching to the aid of the increasingly neutered and powerless emperor Antemius, contending not only with the Visigoths in Gaul and the Vandals in Africa, but also his own increasingly powerful Germanic generals, such as Ricimer, who sought to turn the emperor into a puppet. Although very little is known of Riotimus, it seems likely that he was one of these strongmen who had carved out substantial power for himself within the former Roman province of Britannia during the 4th and 5th centuries, where semblances of Roman administration did survive for some decades after the official withdrawal of the legions by around 410. The historian Zosimus writing a century later, claimed that as early as 409 AD, the Armoricans, encouraged by the example of the insular Britons, had thrown off the Roman yoke, amidst attacks by Germanic newcomers. Though every now and again they were brought back into the fold, as the years went by, it became increasingly obvious which way the wind was blowing, and provincial areas increasingly looked to their own local leaders, rather than Rome. Though this was not without opposition. The anonymous Gallic Chronicle refers to a Celtic chieftain named Tabato, who attempted to maintain an independent Armorica in 435 AD, but was captured and slain two years later. By 470, in his magnum opus, The Origins and Deeds of the Goths, Jordanus states that Riotimus, King of the Britons, brought a seaborne fleet over the channel from Britain, leading 12,000 men deep into central Gaul, into the old territory of the Biturages. Presumably, whilst there, he aimed to link up with the army of the ailing provincial leadership, and then to engage Eurix Visigoths together. Before the Romano-Britons could meet the Gallo-Romans, however, Yorick appeared with the full might of his army, battle-hardened veterans from a lifetime of war. Jordanus records what happens next. Now Yorick, king of the Visigoths, perceived the frequent change of Roman emperors and strove to hold Gaul by his own right. The emperor Antemius heard of it and asked the Britones for aid. Their king, Riotimus, came with 12,000 men into the state of the Bitteriges by the way of Ocean, and was received as he disembarked from his ships. Yorick, king of the Visigoths, came against them with an innumerable army, and after a long fight he routed Riotimus, king of the Britons, before the Romans could join him. So, when he had lost a great part of his army, he fled with all the men he could gather together, and came to the Burgundians, a neighbouring tribe then allied to the Romans. But Euric, king of the Visigoths, seized the Gallic city of Arvernum, for the emperor, Antemius, was now dead. Riotimus' army was routed, and the survivors either fled to the realm of the Burgundians, then allied to the Romans, or back to Armorica, 
fast becoming a safe haven and refuge for all manner of Roman and Gallic citizens fleeing from the Goths, other barbarian tribes, and from Roman masters. In particular, landless peasants and runaway slaves continued to flee into the area in search of refuge and a new beginning. A situation evidenced by a surviving letter sent to Riotimus by the Bishop of Claremont, Sidonius Apollinarus. Writing to his friend Riotimus, the bishop complained on the behalf of Roman landowners that armed Bretons were enticing their slaves away from them. It is possible that Riotimus was betrayed by Arvandus, the Gallo-Roman Praetorian prefect then in charge of the provincial army of Gaul. Arvandus was removed from office in 472 and sent to Rome in chains for the crime of treason, possibly for attempting to dissuade Yorick and the Visigoths from concluding peace with Rome in an attempt to seize power for himself. Within a couple of years, in 472, the Emperor Antimius was dethroned and beheaded by the Germanic general Ricimer, and a new, more docile Emperor, Alibrius, put on the throne. In all but name, the Empire was dead. Unfortunately, because of a lack of written sources from this time period, very little else is known of Riotimus, including his eventual fate. Though in recent years, he has sometimes been identified as a possible inspiration for the legend of King Arthur. The 12th century writer and popularizer of the King Arthur myth, Geoffrey of Monmouth, wrote that Arthur crossed the channel from Britain to attack Rome, and that he was betrayed by Mordred, which in itself could be a half-remembered nod to Riotimus's betrayal by Arvandus. The Breton historian Léon Fleurier furthermore suggested that Riotimus may in fact be one and the same figure as the renowned Romano-Bretonic general Ambrosius Aurelianus, who is said to have led the fight back against the Anglo-Saxon invasions in the 5th and 6th centuries. Flerio suggested that Riotimus may have led the Britons in battle against the Goths before returning to Britain to continue the war against the Anglo-Saxons. Whether or not Riotimus's military power was exaggerated by Jordanus, writing a century later, it is clear that by the latter 5th century, Armorica, with its strong ties to southern Britain, was fast becoming a new centre of power. As we shall see, as Rome fell, rather than collapse themselves, the people of southern Britain and northwestern Gaul increasingly looked inward to reforge old links and look to a new future. By the 5th century, not only did the Celts of Gaul and Britain have a close trading relationship with one another, but both sides of the channel had already been mixing for centuries. So much so that many shared the same language, traditions and even rulers some holding lands on both sides of the channel. Rather than a barrier, the sea was an opportunity to these people, a road system linking up trading communities from Wales to Galicia on the Spanish northern coastline. The Armoricans themselves, the Gallic tribe who gave the province its name, even in Julius Caesar's day, were expert mariners capable of constructing vast fleets, such as the one they supposedly fled to, ultimately unsuccessfully, upon Caesar's invasion in the first century BC. Even before the Roman invasion of Britain, relations between the north of Gaul and the south of Britain had been strong. For centuries, maritime trade had flourished and some rulers, just like they would do once again after Rome fell, and probably beforehand, throughout Roman rule, 
held lands on both sides of the channel. A good example being Caesar's one-time cavalry commander, Commius, the Belgic king of the Atrobates, who, although he was traditionally regarded as a Gallic leader, seems to have been able to muster men from inside Britain during Caesar's invasion in 54 BC, and later retired there after the unsuccessful Gallic rebellion of Vercingetorix led to the total Roman conquest of Gaul. This tradition of holding lands on both sides of the sea continued well into the early Middle Ages when the collapse of links to elsewhere in the empire led to a newfound reliance on insular trade. According to a theory put forward by historians such as John Morris, the first migrations from Britain to Armorica took place before the Anglo-Saxon invasion even began, in the last days of the united and all-powerful Roman Empire. Specifically, during the time of the usurper Magnus Maximus in the late 4th century. The 12th century medieval historian Geoffrey of Monmouth is the first to have put forward this tradition, asserting that Magnus instructed the legendary figure Conan Meriadoc to take large numbers of civil and military personnel to create a second Britain in Armorica. Geoffrey echoes the much earlier Welsh monk Nennius' claim, writing in the 8th century, that Maximus took soldiers to Gaul on his ultimately unsuccessful bid for the imperial throne. According to Nennius, these were Armorican Britons and they never returned to Britain to this day. According to John Morris, the second mass migration to Armorica took place in the late 5th century. If the later English tradition is to be believed, following the mutiny of Jutish mercenaries under Hengist and Horsa, with Germanic tribes such as the Franks, the Alemanni and Thuringians pouring over the Rhine into Gaul, just as Anglo-Saxons poured into Britain, the face of Romano-Celtic Gaul was changing. The remote peninsula of Armorica, the land of the sea, wasn't seriously affected by the Frankish invasions, and may have provided a sort of safe haven against these incursions, much as Wales and Cornwall did in Britain against the Anglo-Saxons. Armorica had remained fairly isolated from Rome over the centuries and didn't have as many prizes as the rest of Gaul, with less wealth to plunder. Consequently, it relied on the rest of the empire less and was able to thrive after its decline. Though Anglian and Saxon pirates ravaged the coasts, just as Franks and Goths ravaged the hinterlands, the Celts of Armorica and Britannia were able to fend off attackers and retain control of their lands, seeing more and more refugees and exiles coalesce over the years to add to their strength. According to Morris, the third and final exodus seems to have taken place during the middle of the 6th century, in the years following the resurgence of Anglo-Saxon attacks. And if the traditions are to be believed, the death of King Arthur Unfortunately, we may never know the truth, yet the fact remains etched in archaeology and the spoken tongue that by the 6th century, substantial numbers of Britons had emigrated or fled to Brittany. The migrations were so substantial that a distinct language and culture formed during the early Middle Ages. Not only settlers, but also clerics and priests from Britain flooded into Brittany, leading to the county looking to the Gaelic insular church of Iona as much as to the Church of Rome. Just as a Frankish kingdom was born in Gaul and a Visigothic one in Hispania, at least three kingdoms developed in Armorica, all with their linguistic roots over the channel in Britain. 
Domnoni, Cornwall, and Brerach. By the middle of the 6th century, the Kingdom of Domnonia shares the same name as Domnonia in Britain. Likewise, Cornwall in the southeast likely comes from Curno or Cornwall in Britain. They may have actually been ruled over by kings holding lands on both sides of the channel, with Cunnamoros of Cornwall also ruling in Kernev in Brittany. The third kingdom was Broeric, with its capital at Vans. It was this kingdom that seems to have eventually united the others, again during an age of uncertainty and violence, this time from a new, increasingly powerful and foreign enemy who held sway in the rest of Gaul, the Franks. According to the great Frankish chronicler Gregory of Tours, it was King Warrock of Broerec who seized the opportunity of Frankish attacks to unite the people of Armorica under a single banner to throw them back. Warrock's successor, Warrock II, was in turn succeeded by his son, Canal, who defeated yet another Frankish army near Van. In AD 635, another ruler, Judicial of Brittany, managed to conclude a treaty with Dagobert, King of the Franks, agreeing the political frontiers of the Breton Kingdom. For over a hundred years, Brittany was left to develop peacefully. Presumably, the rulers of the other kingdoms either retired to their lands in Britain or were overthrown. The Kingdom of Brittany was born. By around 720, the last links with Wales, and perhaps other areas of Britain, began to be severed. With archaeological and linguistic evidence suggesting that the areas began to go their own separate ways. Finally, by the 8th century, now revitalised under a brand new dynasty, the Franks returned to subdue the region once more. In 753, Pepin the Short, one of the first of Francia's new Carolingian rulers, attempted to invade Brittany, but was largely unsuccessful. The Bretons continued to refuse to acknowledge Frankish superiority, regularly refusing to pay tribute. It wasn't until 799 that Pepin's descendant, the great king Charlemagne, succeeded in temporarily subduing the region. The Bretons had potentially risen up after the death of Roland, Lord of the Breton Marches, on his way back from Hispania, a figure famous from the epic poem later composed to commemorate his passing. By 800, faced with insurmountable odds, Charlemagne finally managed to subdue the Bretons, exacting hostages, and according to Einhard, Charlemagne's biographer, they promised to do whatever he wished next. In 818, however, just four years after Charlemagne's death, under a new king, Morvan, once again, the Bretons drove the Franks out. They would be back, of course, under Charlemagne's son, Louis the Pious, defeating the next king, Viermarch, in battle. Finally, the Bretons submitted, under a new ruler named Nomino, who agreed to pledge his allegiance to the Franks, on condition that they would retain self-rule. Nomino used this time to consolidate the county and to wait for the inevitable breakup of Frankish power that usually occurred after the death of a king. In the meantime, a new threat had appeared from the seas of the north. A fearsome foe that threatened both Breton and Frank alike, and in time would bring them both together like never before. Brought in on dragon-headed longboats, a new age was about to dawn. 
an age of opportunity and chaos to rival that which followed the collapse of Rome, but thankfully, one with far more sources to chronicle it. The age of the Vikings had begun. <laughs>